The 80s. What a decade, right? I mean, I wasn't alive then, and I assume most of my audience wasn't either, so I can't actually speak for the decade itself. <sighs> but 80s movies were the best. No wonder all anyone wants to do is remake them. Well, maybe they weren't as good as movies from the 70s. And we're only talking about American movies. Because you could argue that the 60s in Europe were poppin', due to Fellini being at the top of his game in the meltdown in the USSR. You know what, let's not go down this rabbit hole. This is the Kino Corner, not Frederick Knudsen. Anyways, getting back to it. If you were like me, you grew up on 80s movies. Indiana Jones, Star Wars, The Goonies, Stand By Me, all that stuff. It's pretty easy to notice, but generally there were two kinds of popular 80s films. Action adventure films, and films about kids. Sometimes they'd combine, like in Back to the Future, but for this video we're just going to focus on the kids' films, and more specifically the teen films. The 80s? That was a decade to be a teenager in the movies. The 80s had John Hughes. It had John Hughes before he made Baby's Day Out. He was making hit after hit. Sixteen Candles, Ferris Bueller's Day Off, Pretty in Pink, Weird Science, <laughs> The Breakfast Club. But answer me this. Did John Hughes make The Godfather? No. Did John Hughes make Apocalypse Now? <laughs> no. 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 No, he didn't. It was the Italian stallion Francis Ford Coppola who made them. Now, all you kids may know Coppola as the guy that makes the wine that all your moms drink, but you know, he's also kind of a filmmaker. And he made the best teen film of the 80s, Rumblefish. Rumblefish is everything that John Hughes films weren't. It had expressive cinematography. It integrated mythology into its story. It was surreal, abstract, and a lot of other really cool adjectives. There's a rule in filmmaking. Show, don't tell. So I'll show you. Let's have a look at some shots from The Breakfast Club. Look, the lighting is flat. It's set up like a play. It's been done as a play a million times. Why should we watch this as a film? Other than to see Emilio Estevez destroy glass with a screen. Now let's look at Rumblefish. Yeah, it's black and white. If that's a turnoff for you, you have bad taste. Color and black and white are both viable tools of expression in cinema. Look at the shadows and the camera angles. How we get so much information about the characters and the world from every single shot. Now I think that The Breakfast Club is a solid movie. It's not perfect, but it's still pretty good. I just want to showcase how different Rumblefish was from its peers. And to answer the major question on people's minds. Yes, it was Nick Cage's first film role. You could possibly say that it was Fast Times at Ridgemont High, but he was just an extra in that, so it doesn't count. Coppola shot Rumblefish back to back with The Outsiders. He used a lot of the same cast and crew, and he shot both films in Tulsa. He wrote the script to Rumblefish while shooting The Outsiders, and there was only a two week break between the productions. All he did, from what I could tell, is send the cruise bot back to one of his Scientificology recharging stations in LA and replace him with the shamanistic savior of Hollywood himself, Nicolas Cage. Both The Outsiders and Rumblefish were written by the same woman, S.C. Hinton. So it makes sense that Coppola should shoot them as a double feature, at least when seen from a surface level. But they're as different from each other as two films could be. Coppola shot The Outsiders in a classic Hollywood style, but Rumblefish was the anarchist art film that would keep him sane. There's more to this. You see, Coppola went sort of crazy shooting Apocalypse Now. It went way over time and over budget, and he ended up taking out mortgages and loans and whatnot, and then agreed to do a romance movie to pay back the investors. There's a whole documentary called Hearts of Darkness that you should watch. When he you says, who why? are you? you why don't you why? say, who are you? Because I haven't learned my lines yet. I know, you've why. had him for five days. <laughs> well, Apocalypse Now did terrific in the box office, but the film he agreed to make when he freaked out, one from the heart, bombed and put Coppola $20 million in debt. Like hot damn. 20 mil in the hole. He could have declared bankruptcy. But our proud Italian Stalin was going to finish this race. He was going to finish the fight, no matter how hard he was beaten. He was going to pay it all back, so he had to work more than ever before. So let's stop beating around the proverbial bush. Is Rumblefish Kino? And I'm going to answer this question with another question. Do you even have to ask? But for those people just tuning in to this specific minute and second, yes, it is Kino. What's the story? Well, without spoiling too much, Rumblefish follows Rusty James, played by Matt Dillon, and his brother, the motorcycle boy, played by Mickey Rourke. 
Rusty runs the gang that his brother used to lead, before his brother left for California. Well, the motorcycle boy is back, and their downfall is just beginning. Rusty slowly realizes that nostalgia and fantasy cloud his memory, and that his brother isn't as mentally stable as he once thought. I don't want to dwell on the story, though, because I want you to watch the film. You may think that Coppola making a teen film is out of character, but it's not. It's got the teen drama, sure, but there's also gang politics going on. Nicolas Cage plays Smokey, an Iago-type guy who uses sinister plotting to wrestle control of the gang from Rusty. But by that time, how much of the gang is left? It makes sense that a guy who directed films about big-time gangsters would make a film about wannabe gangsters. It's also got this dreamlike and mythological feel to it. Lawrence Fishburne is like Mercury. He's always there to give Rusty the news. Tom Waits is this mumbling soda shop bartender who rattles on about time. Speaking of time, we hear ticking clocks throughout the film, not to mention clocks occupying the foreground and background in tons of shots. Time slips by sometimes and sometimes time moves slowly. It creates this great tension throughout the film. Their time is running out. Dennis Hopper also stars as the alcoholic father of Rusty James and the Motorcycle Boy. He's never sober in this movie, and I don't think he's acting. Supposedly, they had to do 48 takes of him in one scene, possibly due to his state of mind. But Coppola managed to get a great performance out of him in Apocalypse Now, and he does the same here. Fun fact, Jack Nicholson was first approached for this role, but he turned it down because he didn't like the script. It was also in Jack Nicholson's house that Roman Polanski sexually assaulted a girl, but I don't know what that has to do with this movie. All I know is that I'm glad Coppola went with the patrician Easy Rider. And there's young Sofia Coppola here, before she would ruin Godfather 3, but more than make up for it with all of her Femkino movies. You know, I should do a video on her. Everyone, make a mental note. Or, you know, just berate me until I do. But the two scene stealers are Matt Dillon and Mickey Rourke. Rusty James is brutish, loud, and over the top, while the motorcycle boy is subtle and soft-spoken. They are the two types of chads. Rusty wants to be just like his brother, but we all know it can never happen. They made Rorick look like Albert Camus with the way he carries himself, and the way his cigarettes stangle out of his mouth. His line delivery also plays into the whole philosopher king persona, but his kingdom doesn't have much time left. What seems like an odd pairing in this film is the friendship between Steve and Rusty. Steve is this geeky guy, but they've been friends since kindergarten. They couldn't be further apart in terms of personality. But I'm going to lay down a theory real quick, and then move on to the rest of the video. Steve isn't real. Let's look at it. They're practically inseparable, and Steve knows everything Rusty is thinking. He says so himself. I think that Steve is a personification of Rusty's rational self. The person who tells him the real truths, even though he may not want to believe them. He's Rusty's own voice of reason within and outside of himself. But enough about the stories and characters and themes and all that superfluous nonsense. Let's talk about the cinematography. Oh man, what great cinematography. The black and white really helps in placing the film in its own world, and the subtle uses of color serve as a great visual metaphor for Rusty's state of mind. Here's a fun fact. Not all of the shadows in the film were made by light. They were painted onto the sets, like in the pool room and at Patty's house. You couldn't get away with this in color, but it elevates the level of expression in each frame. It's no wonder that Coppola took inspiration from some of the great German Expressionist films for Rumblefish. The Expressionist lighting, excellent tracking shots, and non-traditional camera angles culminates in a mesmerizing visual experience. Tell me this isn't the coolest fight scene ever. This pumps me up. It's like if fight milk was a celluloid image. And look at this breakup scene. She walks into the fog of memory right in front of him. And we can't forget about the near-death experience. They didn't use CGI, so they put him in a metal cast of his body and actually had him flying and rotating above the sets. I could watch this scene all day. But visuals aren't everything. Stuart Copeland, also known as the drummer for that band Sting was in, provided a soundscape as eccentric as the visuals. It's percussive and sharp, keeping to the beat of the film. Copeland supposedly was on set laying down the beats for the actors during the scenes. You really feel that in the movie. Everything moves to the rhythm. That, mixed with the incredible sound design, makes this film just as much an aural treat as a visual one. 
One of the really cool aspects of the film is something you don't see on screen. Coppola pioneered pre-visualization with this movie. Nowadays, pre is standard, especially for stunt work, but it was almost unheard of back in the early 80s. He shot the entire movie with the actors on video cameras against a blue screen during pre-production in order to get the feel of scenes and determine shots. It was revolutionary for its time. Even if you don't like the film, you have to appreciate how Coppola used this film to further the craft. Upon its release in 1983, it was met with poor box office sales and poor reviews. It's one of those films that's gotten more respect over time, making it the dark horse of 80s teen films. Don't look at the reviews. Consider the fact that Francis Ford Coppola considers this one of his best films, and that it's Sophia's favorite film of her dad's. Richard Linklater called it Coppola channeling Bergman out of respect for the film, which is accurate. Coppola made an art film for teenagers. Who else does that? So, if you haven't really gotten into art films, but are looking for an entryway, watch Rumblefish. It's entertaining as hell, but it will also stay in your head for a very long time. The first time I watched it, I immediately restarted it once the credits rolled. If that's not a glowing recommendation, I don't know what is. What does it all look like to you? Black and white TV with the sound turned low. And as a postscript, while at VidCon, I got to meet and hang out with Rusty Cage and a bunch of other great YouTubers. But because this film is so ingrained in my brain, I would constantly refer to him as Rusty James. But it makes sense, doesn't it? Rusty James is in Nick Cage's first film. And there's knives, and it's weird, and it's anarchic. I mean, Rusty, Rusty James, Nicholas Cage, Rusty Cage. You know, maybe there's a connection. But that's just a theory. Uh... <laughs>